I already signed in. To Twitter? Oh, no, not to Twitter. Oh, shit, I changed my password. I can't think of anything useful. What are you um, trying to do? I'm trying to get this link out somewhere. Um, maybe we can restart XChat. No, because I think Freenode's blocked our IP address. Finally. Oh, oh, why? Because if you get so many people connecting from the same IP address, they assume oh, yeah, you're a bad yeah, person. I have problems, yeah. It is hard to try to connect. Trying it online. Uh, oh, it's it's fine. Fine. You're either a bad person oh, shit, we or got a it. university. Wanted yeah. <laughs> it's better wow. to just ban you. <laughs> oh, well, nope, we got on the right channel. Okay. All right, nice. Uh, that yeah, and then. That and it's running. Yeah, but we want to flip thing much. I have no idea how to do that. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. good We're gonna we'll be. Roll with I'm it. gonna be doing that after the conference. Ruin it. I'll do it live. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna try so, the effect. No, no, no. no. no? Maybe, maybe, yeah, that, that's probably. I mean, just reverse the view trust. Yeah, we can put that where. Uh. This setting. Yeah. No, no. No? Okay. Yeah, no, I don't. Wait, wait a second. Is that all right? I think there is an option from T. It will not launch those. Oh. What? What? <laughs> no, okay. All right. That's for them. All righty. Yeah, well, anyway, there. I'll just go for it. Yep. Yeah, it's no big deal. All right. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Ryan. Um, my talk is called Federated and Free. It focuses on distributed and decentralized applications. Um, maybe on OpenShift. Um, some of these are great projects, and uh, really close to getting a couple of them running on OpenShift, and hopefully. This talk still gives you the impression of what's possible. Um, I was up late trying to get this demo together, and a couple pieces didn't quite fit. But um, I have full confidence in the ability to run these apps on OpenShift, and they're still really cool to look at regardless, I think. Um, how many of you guys write uh, web applications? Or do you guys are on the not just on the server side, not just writing. Uh, you know, well, scripting, but actually doing web development as well. Okay, cool. This hopefully will be relevant for you guys. Um, so, like I said, I'm Ryan uh, Ryan Jarvman or Ryan J on Twitter, IRC, GitHub, um, anywhere you need to find me. Um, look me up as Ryan J, and hopefully you get the right guy. Um, so I work for Red Hat on the OpenShift team. Um, I'm in the evangelist, uh, OpenShift evangelist group. Uh, so I do a lot of talks like this. Um, usually they're a little bit more, a little bit more prepared. This is my first time doing this one. Uh, so let's see. One thing that the cloud has taught me, um, and, and there's a lot of lessons from the cloud when you look at, uh, you know. How do you scale? How do you uh, have high uptime? Um, but one major lesson, the takeaway that I've had is plan for failure. You're going to have servers go down. And in fact, in Amazon EC2, this is one of the main pieces of advice they try to give you is plan for these instances to be, you know, dropping out of existence from time to time and set up a robust network infrastructure that can handle these types of failures, right? Um, so I thought about that, and I thought, you know, is is your social network provider too big to, to fail? You know, is there problems with having kind of all your eggs in one basket? Pro and con, why maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't, and uh, hopefully I have a fair assessment here. Um, and also another thing to think about, anytime I do deployments, before I do roll out that code, I always think, what's the worst that could happen, right? Um, it's always a good reality check when you're about to deploy. Um, you know, make sure you have a backup plan and another backup plan after that. <laughs> um, 
And sorry to mix metaphors, this is a Star Trek slot, or Star Trek slide here, the rest are uh, Star Wars. So I know I don't want to start any religious wars here, but um, okay. So one big thing that really gets to me is uh, terms of service. Um, when you're dealing with a large social platform, um, you often have no, no ability to negotiate. Um, the terms are subject to change at any moment, right? Totally out of your control. And uh, you may be banned without warning. And I've had a lot of friends that have been in that situation where they've had a lot of content in their social network and suddenly they're locked out, right? And what do they do with that, right? So, um, yeah, the, the terms may change at any time. Uh, you may think you're getting into a, a deal possibly with someone you trust, right? Uh, we got Consolo and Lando here, right? He thinks he can trust his, uh, his cloud hosting provider in this case, right? <laughs> Turns out, <laughs> <Wow>. yeah. <laughs> Turns out something's up in Cloud City that uh, the administrator didn't even know was going on, right? Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, often these policies are not set by the network admins of the company. They're set by, you know, who knows if these people are actually technical or not. Um, so one big question to ask yourself is, can your data be exported in an open format? I know Google's gotten a lot better at this. Um, Facebook was kind of playing with this. At some point, you could export some of your data, but not other parts of data, and then they realized they were leaking a bunch of met metadata that they were not supposed to collect at all. Like if you had your privacy settings said never collect this, but then you dumped all your data, you, you found out that they actually were collecting it, <laughs> right? Um, so I think that's one big question if, if you are, uh, if you do decide to go stick with a large social network, and there's plenty of good reasons to do that. You want to be at a large uh, pool of, uh, you know, you want to be able to meet where your friends are at, right? You want to be able to join your real life social circle, not just your online social circle. Um, and you need, you need to be at a place where lots of identities are there. So who, who is your identity broker, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of different people online that are assessing your identity. Um, some of that's going to be, of course, your email provider is, is commonly used as an um, identifier. Um, your phone number for certain companies may be an identifier for you. Uh, you don't see it as often online, at least not right up in your face, but maybe your credit score might be taken into account. Um, probably not for online with your social security number, but that's a very common identifier. Um, Google and Apple. <laughs> Advertising, 
Um, they can end up, if they don't have a solid revenue stream, um, they can end up basically using your information as a, a way to monetize to advertising agencies, whether they're re revealing your personal information or just aggregate statistics. Um, it depends on how much ad advertising personalization you usually have, but that's often the, the you know the main revenue driver for a lot of these guys is um, is the advertising sneaking into the background. Um, another big thing to look at, um, at least I don't know how many of you guys have heard of this uh, term, NIM rights. Nobody. Okay. Well, this is what one of my uh, one of my friends from the West Coast is actually championing some of this effort. He has a website up called nimrights.org. And basically, it's it's focused on um, allowing people to have a pseudonym online. Um, Facebook has is basically required; they want your real identity. Um, I know I used to work at Second Life uh, for Linden Lab and uh, worked on Second Life, so everyone there had virtual identities and very comfortable with having a pseudonym. In fact, it was basically required. Um, so a lot of them were very comfortable with their online profile and wanted to make a Facebook account to go with it, right? So they added all this data. Second Life put a ton of effort in this huge um, cross-site integration where your Second Life avatar could have a Facebook account. They did this big Facebook Connect, you know, rollout. And then about two weeks later, Facebook says, sorry, real identities only, and shut down the whole project. Right, um, they invested tons of money in this in this integration, and everyone got banned. Right, everyone got locked out of their data. Everyone lost all the information that they had uploaded. Um, and so, this project is is really focusing on stopping discrimination. Um, and, and with the Second Life case, I know there would be people like uh, there would be people with their real life name was Britney Spears. You know, there's more than one. It's not like a unique identifier. They put that on their account name, and they would get banned for infringement, a copyright infringement from a, a music company would come in and be like, no, actually, we know the real Britney Spears. It's a unique key. Uh, no one else could be known as this name within Second Life, right? Um, so just weird stuff like that. Like, you have no control if you have, if you don't dictate, if you don't have any say in the terms of service. Um, you're really at a loss as a consumer. You don't really have a lot of freedom there. So this is this project's both about stopping discrimination and also preserving your rights to privacy. Um, I know these are, uh, you know, privacy freedom really fits well with the Fedora, you know, kind of spirit. So um, one interesting law I found related to this and in Germany they have this uh, Telemedia Act that says uh, businesses must allow you to operate under your pseudonym if that's what you prefer. Um, so they've actually put out legislation that says this is a valid way of preserving your privacy, right? Um, and, and I know in the U.S. there's a lot of, uh, you know, proposed legislation for online services to require, you know, hard evidence that you are indeed the person that they're talking to, whether that's social security information or some other, you know, your bank account number, some other hard identification that you are indeed the real person. Um, and, and there's good reasons to require that, you know, if, if you have spam and abuse and fraud and other things, like, you want to be able to combat those for sure, but um, banning everyone who's named Britney Spears or, you know, other weird things like that is never going to get you there. So there's, uh, you can have some more finesse about that process. Um, in the U.S., uh, like like I was saying, as, as we move more of our lives online into a digital environment, we often lose the ability to negotiate with the businesses we deal with. Um, there's not really a democratic process. Uh, you know, really, all you have left as a consumer is free market choice, right? And when you're only dealing with a few number of large social outfits. Um, you know, maybe you have some choice. It kind of depends on convincing all of your friends to move along with you. That's the gotcha, right? I could say, hey, I'm going to go back to Alan instead of Twitter, but how 
how many followers am I going to really hit the same audience, right? Probably not. Um, so at least we still got free market uh, realities. There's supply and demand, um, and we'll see how that plays out in the next next slide. Uh, so uh, one big effort that I've seen people do is is uh, effort to establish an open protocol for decentralized identity on the web. Um, this is probably stuff if you guys are web developers, you're well familiar with this. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of OpenID, right? OpenID definitely. Uh, Google actually has a form of OpenID available. I forget the, the URL, like account.google slash profile slash me or something. And then if you hit that while your session is authenticated, it'll re bounce you over to your actual OpenID URL. Um, and so I use Google's kind of a single sign on to log into Stack Overflow and other sites. Um, OpenID is great. Um, the downside is if you lose your password or get locked out of the account, you get locked out of all the, you know, I get locked out of not just Google, but also Stack Overflow and wherever else. So um, I like the idea of OpenID. I actually considered hosting my own OpenID server at home, so I had ultimate control over my identity. And then I was like, yeah, I have like a Comcast cable connection. That thing drops out so often. If I continually lose access to log in to every site, it's not going to work. So you really need up uptime on all of these. Um, right? OAuth is another one very popular um, that can allow kind of anyone to sign up and or, or provide a OAuth provider service. And then you also have OAuth consumers. So uh, your login with GitHub. GitHub is the OAuth provider in that case, and the consumer is whatever other third-party website you're signing in. Uh, same thing with OAuth 2. OAuth 2 has a nice kind of a client side. You can actually do fully client side applications in JavaScript with OAuth 2, but then you have to store the session key or the uh, uh, access token in the browser session, which could be uh, potentially read by other scripts. Like if you load up a compromised version of jQuery, they could steal your access token and claim to be you. Um, not very likely if your whole JavaScript session gets compromised. You probably have a lot of things to worry about. But um, you know, I, I, I like the OAuth 2 uh, workflow. I've seen plenty of people criticize it. Probably the other thing about open OAuth, I mean, OAuth 2 is that you can time limit the access token. You definitely can, yeah. So a provider can say, yeah, you get this token for a day. So someone has your account for a day, but they don't have it. Exactly, yeah. There's a there's a renew thing. And another great thing with OAuth 2, there's something called data access scopes. So you could be authorized for certain types of activity. Um, that was one big thing that I always wanted to do. Uh, I, I used to work at Eventbrite, and so I would cross-authenticate. I'd build a third-party app, and I'd say, all right, this app can allow me to display my attendee list, right? But it was an all-or-nothing access grant. Like, if I granted this third-party site the ability to display my attendee list, it could also go delete my event, update the billing info, put in their own bank account instead of mine, and start collecting all of, all of my event money. Right? There was like a major, you know, you need to lock it down. So if you're going to authenticate some JavaScript app, it's not able to override your banking data, right? <laughs> um, that, that was due to Eventbrite, not due to. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it, and I'm not trying to criticize Eventbrite, you know, uh, but there's there's great controls within OAuth 2 for limit, uh, limiting the um, access to data um, and having that really be user. Um, User controllable, um, so that's one of my favorites. Uh, so yeah, what happens when we get locked out? Um, like I said, with OpenID, that's that's pretty likely. Uh, whoops, flipped the wrong way. Okay, or better yet, what's our switching cost, right? That's a what happens if we get locked out? Uh, you know, I, that's a big concern. But this is a question I like focusing on even better. What's my switching cost? Um, often with open source projects, you can tell anyone, hey, you guys, you can all spin out a copy of Fedora, but there's a cost there, right? Am I going to recommend to my grandmother to run Fedora? Possibly. Um, but she's going to have to invest a lot in learning, right? Um, it's true with any operating system. But um, platform, 
becomes hopefully the ability to export your data and slam it into another clone of the same same source. Um, so in a way that the tech industry has really been struggling with the same question in regard to uh, infrastructure, what's our switching cost, right? And they were looking at uh, Amazon and EC2 and being like, wow, these guys are really starting to monopolize this field. Um, how can we protect ourselves by keeping the switching costs low? And so the standard uh, that got put out by Rackspace was OpenStack. Um, Red Hat's currently the number one contributor, go team, right, um, on the OpenStack effort, uh, which is great news, you know, really liberating infrastructure as a service and servers on demand, um, which keeps the switching cost low. So your worst case scenario, your, when you ask that question, what's the worst that could happen, you can always pack up and go to another uh, server farm, right? And that's that's great to have that on your side. Um, also, when it comes to social platforms, who is the customer and, and do we have any control in this? Like I said with the terms of service earlier, it may be the advertising agencies that are that are really the customer that the social network has in mind rather than the users of the site. Um, so you know, watch out for uh, Watch out for companies that don't have a strong uh, revenue stream and that, you know, uh, aren't able to sustain themselves and, and are forced to look for other, other ways to monetize. Um, so me as a consumer, what do I do to protect myself? I seek out utilities that specialize in serving my interests, right? Um, particularly one way that I see that kind of affects my activity, and I don't see a lot of people do this, but I hate getting locked into two year long cell phone contracts, right? I hate it. Um, I want to have the freedom to keep my switching costs low, right? So I buy my own hardware. There's an initial upfront cost, but I can, I can pack up and leave at a moment's notice and take my phone to whatever competitor is going to offer me the best service or the best privacy or whatever is, you know, whatever I want to optimize on. Uh, at, at that given moment, right? So it enables me with freedom as a consumer. Um, one thing I've seen from ISPs, sometimes they'll do uh, data prioritization and they'll, if, if they're a internet provider and also doing streaming media, like AT&T or something, sometimes they'll, they'll up the priority on their own media delivery instead of a competitor like Netflix, right? Um, that's, to me, like, it's, it's really disconcerting. It's almost like my utility company, like my water provider is saying, well, you can brew Lipton iced tea because that's our partner, but, you know, this other tea company, we don't really recognize them as legitimate, and you're going to have to pay double for, you know. So it's like, no, I, I want my utilities. I want to treat them like utilities. Just give me my water and I'll figure out what to do with it, right? And I really expect the, kind of the same behavior out of my ISPs and my social networks and my cell phone company. I want just a, a give me an internet connection, I'll figure out how to tether my laptop, right? Don't charge me an extra $25 for tethering. Give me the internet connection and let me handle it from there, right? Um, uh, Romney had a, a, a quote, um, I, was it, I like being able to fire people or something something uh, to that effect. Um, I kind of sympathize when it, when it comes to social networks. I like having that low switching cost. I like being able to, to swap out. Um, I think as a, as a free market consumer, that really gives me a lot of power. Um, and I like businesses that develop and adopt standards, which I think really enable communities and ecosystems. Three minutes? No. No, 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 no. But I get an extra 15, right? Yeah. Anyway. Oh, sorry, I missed a keynote. Sorry. <laughs> I missed a keynote. Yeah, yeah. Every, everything's. Yeah. I've got 20, Thanks for the heads up, though. I've got 23 minutes left. Okay, cool. All right. Let me see. I think I'm good. All right. So, um, who does your online presence broker recognize as their customers? We kind of went through that. I'll speed through this. Uh, advertising companies sometimes. App.net really tried to focus on that particular problem. They said, hey, forget about the advertisers. We're going to allow you to pay us directly, right? Um, I kind of think, you know, hopefully this is better aligned incentives, but 
maybe not. I mean, maybe advertising is a valid form of, of a revenue stream. You know, uh, maybe it should be something you can opt into. Um, especially, you know, maybe personalized advertising. I probably want to turn off, but um, I don't know if I could get a premium product ad supported. Maybe I don't know. I think um, it's not necessarily evil, right? You don't want to say ads are all bad, right? Um, it's not that black and white. People need to have a revenue stream. Um, but the main question to me is still, what's my switching cost? Can I host my own? Is there lock-in? Um, is this product a walled garden? Um, based on that walled garden status, will it ever really reach critical mass? Um, or will it become one of these kind of too big to fail deals? Um, and I'm not comfortable with those kind of situations either. Um, so for most social networks, platform, even with these open identity standards, Platform uh, and app.net as well. Platform and product are still tightly coupled, right? Uh, you can't take your, as far as I know, take your app.net ID and uh, spin up another app.net server and cross communicate across those servers. Um, so, let's see. Control, yeah. So, next steps, you know, of course, identity and platform, probably we can decouple those concepts. We've seen a lot of standards on open identity. Um, uh, platform as a service. I think we're uh, providing uh, with OpenShift a great standard that anyone can spin up. Uh, one example of that is it's a, a company called GitHub Cloud that has their own OpenShift uh, instance available. Um, and we want open systems all the way down, uh, right? Um, so we've really got that with Fedora, OpenStack, OpenShift. You can have a whole fully open cloud. Um, OK, so solution needs to be open, secure, properly monetized, have the right incentives, minimal switching costs. Uh, but then there's reality, right? Uptime is critical. Do you want to host this in your closet? Maybe not. Um, hopefully, you can pay just for service uptime and not for a bunch of other fluff that your utility is trying to bundle along with. Um, and I kind of like to look at my social network almost as a utility. Um, interoperation and portability is also, are also critical key concepts, right? Um, so who wants to do all this work anyway? Um, OpenShift Online, that's one solution for you guys. Um, they do all their upstream development is on Fedora. Um, like I said, don't like Red Hat, you can go to GitHub Cloud, and I would be surprised if there's not a lot of uh, infrastructure as a service companies rolling out um, OpenShift as a hosting platform for developers uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, so OS, we got liberated. Infrastructure, liberated. OpenStack, RDO's upstream there. Um, platform, liberated. Uh, integrating with, we can also integrate with OpenStack or other systems to use existing identity authentication and authorization services. So if you were using an OpenStack environment with Keystone, um, that's going to be something that OpenShift can integrate with in the future. Um, and I think in the future you're also going to see there's a lot of specialization happening around compute, storage, caching, all these are kind of software as a service or, or service as a service, I don't know, something as a service. <laughs> Pluggable vendor solutions is, is the result, right? Hopefully utility style, right? Like I pay for water, electricity, and whatever else. Um, another cool thing I've, I've uh, heard people asking for is domain registries that support OAuth style authentication, right? Can I log in with my GitHub account, purchase a domain, roll out an OpenShift app, and spin up my own social network all in, you know, 10 minutes, right? That would really give us the low switching cost where people have the freedom to move their data around and uh, they don't have to comply to the terms of service that's dictated to them. So the future of the open cloud is really going to be more distributed. You're not going to have one cloud city. You're not going to have like that uh, Star Trek picture at the beginning, castle on a, on a cloud. You're going to have a large network of, uh, of servers. Um, one project 
specifically on social that does this is uh, diaspora, di diaspora, 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 mm -hmm. diaspora. Nobody. Nobody? All right. You were right. You take a poll. <laughs> diaspora. How many for diaspora? Yeah. Uh, it's about 50-50, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that offers decentralized social multi-home uh, pub sub. You can create one uh, server, and your friends can create another server. You can basically each neighborhood in your community can have their own server, and you can talk across servers with other people. Uh, move your each all the data is stored in that central neighborhood social hub, um, but you can follow people on other servers, comment on other people's activity. Exactly, yeah, RSS is a great way, and in fact, the, from a systems perspective, maybe RSS is all we really need. Adam, right? not RSS, Adam. Adam? Adam. Adam is way better than RSS. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> sort of like anchored the Adam. Okay, good. Then I'm good with that. I, I got, okay, I got slides on this. I want to see more about, uh, I have some links here for, for di diaspora. <laughs> Um, and that they say I'll write on their website focuses on privacy, freedom, and users owning their own data, right? Um, so establishing. Wait, can, we, can, can you just for, does everybody in here know about diaspora? No, okay, good. No, I don't either. So okay. would you actually just it, like my reference is either Twitter or Facebook? It's kind of like Facebook. Yeah. yeah. So there's a centralized web. Everybody runs their own servers, but then there's a centralized web. Yeah, Not yeah. everybody runs their own servers. You don't have to run your own. Like I was saying, like your neighborhood can run their own. Your city could run their own. Your your poker club. There's a bunch of servers running, and then but then where does the when you when I want to talk to it and see what my friends are doing in diaspora? So here's here's one example. You could log in here with your email. You make up a username and a password. You can sign up. Um, you log in on, this is one instance um, of many instances of Diaspora. So is it like BitTorrent kind of the sense that like there's a bunch of servers out there doing stuff, and I take my client and I talk to a seed server, and then that proceeds to do all the stuff um, with all the other servers? Not, not really. Yeah, so so, so what, what happens? More like IRC? Yeah. Uh, I go okay. sign up at, in this website, and I get a username like remember at add sign join diaspora.com. Or maybe another, they, they call it pod. Um, maybe another slide would be, um, I don't know, my, my university slide. Okay, that's how that's how it's the you. Then I go, if, if I want to follow somebody, or if I want somebody to follow me, I'll give them my address, and they can follow me. They have the, they have the pod URL and my username. Yeah, I get that part. I'm wondering, like, but then I want to watch my social stream. Like, where do I go to see what's happening in my social stream? So this can uh, actually follow data from other social streams. Which so my is, pod is subscribed to all the other social streams, yeah. and I go to my it's pod and look at it. I think you, RSS. Can, okay. you can even follow people's activity. Uh, you may not be totally correct on this. Uh, there's a couple of these future versions of this where you can actually follow people's activity on Twitter, right? Which isn't even a the same type of protocol here. Well, there's a there's a, like a social stream um, API that mm -hmm. it implements, and any other service as long as you guys that or, or not yeah. that implements it, you should be able to follow. Okay. I think that is the um, no, I get it. theory, I, at least. So my pod is the place, my central place to grab all my apps. You, you, yeah. for, you have one pod that hosted all of your content, and that's where your data would live. And that's where I'd also go to look at other what's happening for other people in but, my stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll basically, if you set up, I want to follow these other people, then that server, I'm not sure if it does uh, polling or if it's a push, but it basically grabs that content and puts it in your kind of buffer set locally. Yeah. And you could probably have clients that pull your pod. Yeah, right. and, uh, but that's that's the general idea, and there's a lot of people. So unfortunately, Diaspora has uh, kind of faded in popularity. It had a big kind of push about two, three years ago, and it's kind of fallen off a little bit since then. And there's a lot of other competing kind of standards and products coming up now. It's pretty popular amongst photographers. Uh, like there's a big photography community okay. in there. So there's still good reasons but where if you can find your community, you know, it's a it's an alternative option, right? Um, so we want to decouple identity and uh, your data slash activity stream. Um, you want to interact with folks across social hubs. Uh, that's federation, right? Um, multi multi hub, multi pod, whatever you want to call it. The federated network. 
where there is no central authority necessarily. Each pod or is its own central authority. Um, open social is another one that's kind of uh, tried to do something similar. It was kind of like OAuth with the uh, activity streams. Um, and it got bought by Atlassian, and I think it's kind of dying now. It's owned, you know, owned by a big corporate entity, and so the open, open police are like, no, stay away, stay, you know, we don't want too much to do with this. Since now, do we have the freedom to contribute and modify it? Can we still be involved in dictating our social contract and having a democratic process via GitHub, right? <laughs> Uh, so here's where it gets really cool. Tent.io. Tent.io is a new uh, application server. They actually are not even calling it an application server. They're calling it a distributed networking protocol or distributed social protocol. I'm actually going to open this up so we can take a quick look at Tent.io. And if you want to try out Tent.io, uh, you can go to tent.is. Tent um, and they have a big spiel here about how they're, you know, they're really into openness and transparency and uh, that's the one more cynical. <laughs> <laughs> right. They really want to say we, we paid our terms for this. We host our own data. Um, and just like diaspora, you have a multi-home, um, you know, multiple installations of it. Uh, I think I have an account on one of these. Um, is Ryan something. I think I have an account on this on this server. Uh, there's lots of instances of this. Ruby application. Uh, I'd love to have hosted on OpenShift. Um, I'd love to be demoing that right now and say, hey everybody, let's all spin up our own tent server or spin up at least one tent instance for for Flock, right? And then people could pile on there. I will notify you guys via IRC if I get that done this weekend. So it'll be my personal hack project, right? Um, another one I was hoping to demo here is pump.io. That one is less less focused on a protocol and more just like uh, it's from the like a, it's a Node.js project. So all they want to tell you is, hey, look, everything's a stream. That's the that's our only requirement. Everything's a stream, and you have JSON blobs, and then it gets a little hand wavy. You know, <laughs> there's, there's a it's it's really interesting though. It's uh, put together by uh, the the founder of Identica. Evan Pumbro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, what he started with Identica, and that's status net. It sort of migrated off into open social, but. This idea with Pump.io was uh, what didn't happen with Identica is we ended Identica and everybody sort of coalesced here. And this thing, the federated social didn't really happen. Uh, so okay. Pump.io said, you know, I'm not making an interface, I'm not making, uh, it's just a pump. It's yeah. just a pump stream. Yep. And from the start, <laughs> I'm going to create lots of little pumps and, and they're going to randomly be assigned. And from the start, it's going to be federated and sort of constructed. Yeah. yeah. But, but so really, fine. really focused on just pumping data. Yeah. Each, each uh, person kind of owns their own data on their own pod, and there's streams, right? What, what more do you need? Keep it simple, right? Um, <laughs> That's what I, I don't that. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I heard a lot of kind of, uh, I was doing some research before this talk, and there was a certain amount of blowback from like hardcore Identica users that were like, come on, you're shutting us down. Like, this was my home. And now I'm getting locked out, right? Um, hopefully their data is easily interoperable with some other system, right? Uh, hopefully you could pack it in and, and move to well, a well, well, open source. You could actually yeah. and open up your own messenger social that. Oh, cool. All right, that's that's another one I had. Wait, next one on this. Uh, it's uh, GNU socials uh, in my later slide on things to keep an eye on. So here's kind of an architecture diagram. Um, it looks upside down to me, but um, here's you sending out your statuses, messages, photos, profile changes, whatever else would be in an activity stream, essentially. Your central tent server buffers it, and then where everything's running like 10 to 15 minutes late, but you're welcome to come in. Uh, <laughs> or not. Um, and then the data then gets replicated out. All of these guys are either going to do a, uh, for pump, it's actually going to be a push, I think. This, these guys are going to register 
using kind of an observer observable relationship. They're going to say, hey, uh, Ryan, in my case, I want to follow you. And so I start pumping any activity out to this guy who said, I want to be a follower. Then I'm actually aware of who my followers are. Um, with Twitter, you know, you could have a lot of mystery followers that are actually just doing, you know, a search for your name without actually following you, and you could set up bots to follow people without tipping them off. So uh, I kind of like this this model. Um, this really gets you kind of that decentralized, distributed. Here's and another. Also have the range of the nice benefit of not dropping you from following people at random, like yeah. you need to do. Uh huh. This is hard to see, but here you have a couple of kind of network topology centralized. All the all the IOs go to that central hub. Decentralized, you you have a couple pods, and then distributed, kind of everyone's their own pod. Um, it's really kind of like a BitTorrent deal at that point. Um, so what happens if someone comes in and shuts down my pod? I'm screwed, right? Well, you should own your own. No, well, but if I go well, your neighborhood, that, that's why you need high uptime for these. You know, these are really the expectation that, that it's always up. No one's shutting it down. Well, the Start other up. idea is you use open standards, so you can easily export and back up your data and migrate to another Yeah, but actually, pod. suppose my pod is hosted in, uh, I don't know, one, a co-hosting facility. That co-hosting facility, and it's a bunch of us, me and all my friends, all my like my freshman class at college, we all decided to go on it, nerdy friends. That pop, so the NSA or somebody else goes in and uh, grabs that server, I'm yeah. done. Like I can't go to another pod and say, oh yeah, all my information is still on this other pod. I can still log in here, right? It belongs only in my pod, so I'm host. Yeah, that's your backing network. Well, you yeah, could be yeah. backing it up. If it someone's got, hopefully you got off-site backups, and then you could restore that to another server. You take the kind of Amazon EC2 approach. Plan for this thing to go down. You have reliable backups. You could restore the instance. Maybe repoint your DNS if you need to, or your, your host, you know. Uh, so here's some data formats to keep an eye on, and any of these potentially could have a massive shakeup in the future of, of uh, kind of distributed social. RSS3 is uh, still in the works, um, but that might become the data standard that replaces maybe Pump.io or, or Tent.io. Tent is really has, uh, they were trying to do everything really REST style. So anytime you send data, they want to do it as a post, an HTTP post. And that was something they really, they had a really, really interesting GitHub issues list. You go to uh, the Tent.io project on GitHub and look at their early GitHub issues. It's all these kind of deep questions about how restful should we be, what existing standards are there that we want to lean on, which ones are, are what's the pros and cons of each of these. Um, so RSS3 is a great one to keep an eye on. Activity Streams 3 is coming out. Uh, the new social, uh, like you mentioned, um, interesting stuff. Um, and I think what we really need is you know, practical, uh, practical killer apps, including social. Um, I have like a, a app store for OpenShift uh, that is is currently down, but I do have this kind of cool demo that I did um, just last week in New York. I went to the uh, New York Code for America Brigade, and um, they were doing a hackathon on this project called City Bike. So any neighborhood can spin up their own city bike uh, monitoring deal. They could list out, here's the, the city bike stations, and then this is how many bikes are available at each of these stations, right? And so anyone, and this one was near to the offices of Street Easy, whoever that is. Um, so originally, it had a clone me on GitHub. I'm sure you guys are all familiar. I uh, changed the color a little bit and uh, some of the text and switched it to run me on OpenShift. So I'm going to click through on this. And this is really, this is why I'm talking about low switching costs. Think about this when, um, when you log into your local or your social network and you're thinking about how portable is my data, how much control do I have over my own terms of service. So this is what you get with OpenShift Origin or OpenShift Online. Uh, you could run this on Fedora really easy. Um, Steve's talk might cover more of that. 
but this is going in and it automatically pre-populates a URL here. This is City Bikes with an S instead of the previous app was City Bike. Um, it's going to clone this right out of GitHub, right? Spinning up the source. I could do the same thing from the command line as well. Uh, this one's not scaling and will create the application. Um, let's see. I'll bring up that other one. City, yeah, city, city bike with an E. No S. It's a little bit slow to load because it pulls down, like, I think all the data from all the city bike stations and then just does a client side select for, like, here's the three I actually needed. So <laughs> that, I think that's the delay here. <laughs> Um, and you know there's some network speed issues as well, but I think that's the main the main hold up on that. But then you know in a couple minutes I'll, I'll click back to this. I want to speed through. I know I'm running too late on uh, low on time here. Um, but we want to have you know killer open standard distributed real time apps even for Windows users. Um, and so. One, uh, one thing I put together was an app store that will, will basically try to replace Office. And so you have, for, for your docs equivalent, I had uh, Etherpad, right? So you have real-time, collaborative, uh, kind of word document editing, right? There's another project called Ethersheet that basically gives you real-time, open source, collaborative spreadsheets. Um, what else? I have a Node.js collaborative painting program to replace the classic MS Paint. It's about that level of quality. Not great, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's real-time, collaborative, multi-user. Can you see just uh, like the old guy who was doing all these really intricate like landscape paintings in MS Paint? Like, don't make me knock out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. I've seen uh, 3D model viewers and editors. Uh, you know, one-click install on on OpenShift. All this stuff is going to be. You know, really one click to spin up these uh, these apps. So, really, is this platform as a service targeting developers or really anybody? Right? If the developers make it simple enough and make these uh, basically make these as instant apps, I guess DNS isn't haven't propagated yet. Just checking. The the thing didn't say it was done loading, but oh, there we go. All right, done loading. You need to wrap it up. Yeah, all right. I'll wrap it up. So anyway, one click to, to spin it up. Um, so building for communities, right? OpenShift Origin is a great place to get involved. Um, all of our stuff's on GitHub. Um, Code for America, how many people have heard of that? Yeah? Good. All right. Cool. Join, join a local brigade in your neighborhood and spin up a local social hub for those guys. Um, uh, another thing I I'm interested in is a, a project called Crypto Party. It's kind of educating people about cryptography. Once you have all these distributed networks set up, you probably want to have some uh, security as well. Um, and let's see, so we've got development, community building, hackathons. Most of you guys already heard about Code for America, but this really feels like it puts me back into the democratic process as a as a citizen, right? I feel like I'm involved again with my my neighborhood, my government, and dictating that, helping form that social con contract. Um, so for all you guys, you know, take back your data, take back your identity, define your own terms, um, pay for uptime, not for some kind of usage contract. Um, treat your utilities like utilities. Um, and uh, I've got some more info on crypto that I'll, I'll skip over. Oh, actually, this one's really interesting. You do some research later, there's a, there's a topic called fully homomorphic encryption. This is when you can encrypt some information um, and send it over the wire encrypted have someone do an operation, like take one encrypted number and another encrypted number, add them together, and then hand you back the result. And so they're doing operations on this encrypted data without ever actually decrypting it. So they could essentially do the add of these two encrypted numbers, hand you back an encrypted result, and you're the only one who can decrypt the result, right? No. So the whole thing's fully encrypted. The people who are actually operating on the data have no idea what the actual data is. They're just the ones that are authorized to do the, the transaction, right? So that's a big, um, 
I don't know, something that was really interesting to me. There's a great Wikipedia page on it. Um, and that's about it. I think I'll, I'll close up shop. Uh, if you want to sign up for OpenShift, please use this uh, Flock 2013 code. We'll have free signups over in the sponsor room uh, where we'll be giving out awesome USB combo bottle openers. Uh, <laughs> great, great, best, best swag of the event. Uh, all right, stay classy, Cloud City. See you guys next time. <laughs> also, um, check out Media Goblin. It's like a federated YouTube.